All right, I am Carlos Garcia Galan. I'm the head of the European Service Module Integration for the Orion program. The Orion program is part of the Artemis program to take humans back to the moon and maybe beyond. And it's based on the uh, Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. Um, I want to start with a picture taken from the moon of the Earth rising. Uh, it's called Earthrise. And this picture has been called one of the most influential environmental pictures ever taken. It was taken by William Anders from the Apollo 8 mission, uh, which was in 1968, it was the first time we sent humans beyond low Earth orbit. The last flight that we went to the moon with humans was Apollo 17, 1972, 49 years ago. So I'm very excited to be here with you today to tell you how we're going back it's been a long time, but it's time to get back. The next picture I want to talk about is why. You already saw, you know, looking back at the moon, uh, it kind of gave us a perspective of how fragile it is. Definitely not flat. But we got to go well beyond that. This picture is taken from NASA's Curiosity rover from the surface of Mars. And one of the reasons of pushing the envelope. Number one is because the moon is a great stage, staging stone to uh, go beyond. It's a great proving ground, but why? We've already been there, and why go even go to Mars? This picture was a feat to even take it. It, it's, uh, it was taken by a rover the size of a small SUV uh, that traveled almost 100 million miles uh, to go to Mars. It had to enter the atmosphere, it had to do a soft landing, and then it had to point a camera back to Earth. Even the feat of taking the picture is backed up by all the technology that had to be produced to enable that. And all of that technology is things that we then uh, benefit us on Earth. Uh, of course, what we're working to is enabling a human to take that picture next time. The way we're going to do that is through the Artemis program. And most of the times I'm talking about the future of NASA. Well, this is the present. These pictures were taken a couple of weeks ago at the Kennedy Space Center. And it shows you Orion, the Orion spacecraft being stacked on top of the Space Land System rocket. That's the, more power, the most powerful rocket that exists right now. Uh, that picture, some of those pictures are taken like at the 30-second level of the building. It's a huge rocket. Um, and it's, you know, the Orion spacecraft with the launch abort system. Uh, it's on top of the space launch system. And it's been stacked and operated by the folks at the Kennedy Space Center. This is the Artemis One mission. And what we're going to do in the Artemis One mission is we're going to send test the whole system and crewed. We're going to send the spacecraft to orbit the moon, and it's going to be a 26 to 42 day mission. And we're going to test all the systems from the rocket to Orion to the reentry systems prior to actually putting a crew back on it and going back to the moon. The launch window for this mission is February, starts on February of 2022, so it's just around the corner. The only thing we got to do is do the integrated test on the spacecraft, make sure all the components are well integrated, all the functions uh, work. We're going to do another test where we load all the propellant on the launch pad as we would do on the launch day. And then if all of that works, we'll be set for the February 2022 launch date. Uh, and this is all real. Uh, just to, so you can kind of see the perspective of the magnitude of it, I put myself in the pictures. But it, that, that is the whole rocket from across the building and on the picture on the left, you can see just what the Orion spacecraft is, the magnitude of it that sits on top. The next mission after that is gonna be the Artemis II mission. And that will be the first time uh, that we send humans back to the you know, cislunar space, the orbit of the moon since 1972. So what we're gonna do there is test everything the system with humans in it, all the environmental control systems, the controls, and how the crew is going to operate the system. That will be the last test flight before we do the Artemis III mission uh, in the 2024 timeframe, when we're actually going to send the next man and the first woman to step 
foot on the surface of the moon. And for that, we're going to be building not just the SLS rocket and the Orion spacecraft, but also the human landing system, which is we're partnering with commercial companies to develop that. So we're very excited to get into uh, those type of activities. I'm going to talk a little bit about the Orion spacecraft, and then I'll tell you about how it fits in the bigger picture of the Artemis program. So the Artemis spacecraft is several components. You have the crew module, which is the capsule in the middle. That's where the crew is going to live and operate in their trips from the Earth to the orbit of the moon. It's going to keep them alive, and it's going to give them a warm and nice environment for them to work and prepare for the lunar missions. Then it has a service module, which is under the Orion crew module. That's what my job is to integrate in the rest of the spacecraft. Uh, we're partnering with the European Space Agency to build that module. Anyway, that module is what has the engines, the tanks, propellant tanks, and other components that I'm going to talk about a little bit more later to uh, basically enable the spacecraft to be a deep space vehicle. And then on top of the crew module, uh, you have the launch abort system. And we use that in case there is any problem during the ascent phase, launch or ascent phase of the flight. And that will pull the Orion uh, crew module with the crew in it uh, out of the rocket and uh, allow them to land on the water in a safe place. Talking about the launch abort system specifically, uh, it has three main boosters that will basically pull the, the capsule out of the the rocket that is having a problem if we decide that we have to abort, that will go from zero to 500 in two seconds. So if you take a, like one of the top performance cars right now, we normally talk about zero to 60 uh, in like 2.9 seconds. This is zero to 500. It's going to pull 12 Gs on the way out. A G is the force that you normally feel on Earth. If you're in a roller coaster, you're pulling about 4 Gs. This will be about 12 Gs, and it's very impressive because it will outrun the rocket, basically. Even if the rocket was at its full force, 8.8 .8 million pounds of thrust, this will pull the capsule out of that. And then it can steer the capsule to a position where it can be released, and the parachutes can come out, and it can land in the ocean nominally. This is the crew module, and the configuration that you see it in right now, uh, it's been tested for acoustic environments. So that is about uh, 1,500 very uh, high-end speakers that we put around it, and we'll blast it with 140 decibels. A normal rock concert, just so you can get an idea, it's about 120 decibels. And we do that to make sure that everything holds together in the environments of launch. When there's a lot of noise, there's a lot of vibration, and there's a high acoustic environment when that happens. This is just one of the many, many tests we got to do to ensure that the capsule and the system is going to work when you get to space. Space is a very unforgiving environment. So that's why we have to test, we have to have redundant systems, and we do things like that. The, the capsule also has a heat shield. It's about 16 and a half foot. It's the largest heat shield we've ever built. And why do we need a heat shield? When you come back from the moon, you're screaming at 25,000 miles per hour. That's huge. If you're in low Earth orbit, it's about 17,500 miles per hour. So if you remember the space shuttle, for example, mostly it had the black tiles, which is what we use in the upper part of the Orion spacecraft. But the heat shield will take the brunt of that heat coming in, which is about 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit. That's twice as hot as flowing lava from a volcano. So. This is one of the big challenges that we have to ensure. We've never built anything this big. We've built heat shields to endure that type of heat, but not this big to put it on a crude vehicle uh, the size of, of Orion. Uh, it's made of a material called Avcode. And one of the innovative things we're doing, originally we were thinking it would be monolithic, one piece heat shield to develop the Avcode, but We've uh, built it in blocks, so it's a lot easier to manufacture. It's faster, it's cheaper. So it's one of the techniques we're trying and will prove out in the Artemis One flight coming up here soon. This is where the astronauts are going to be inside. So the crew module is going to basically provide an environment. It's going to control the temperature. It's going to control the humidity. It's going to make sure that the right mix of oxygen and nitrogen is there for the crew. And it's a lot bigger than what you see, for example, in Apollo. It will host four crew members, 
for 21 days when the capsule is by itself, when you just have the Orion spacecraft. Of course, we plan for Orion to be docked to other systems, so the mission can be much larger. But uh, in this configuration, it is four crew members and 21 days. And we have sized it since we know that explorers that are going to be astronauts and travel to the moon uh, are going to be of all kinds of shapes. This, we, we've designed the capsule to basically be able to host a very small female to a very large male. And we do tests like this to make sure that in a different configuration, every crew member can reach, pull themselves out, and operate in the capsule accordingly. They're also going to get a new toilet that we're testing in the International Space Station. So, I mean, when you're going to be in a capsule for a couple of weeks, potentially, uh, it, it takes about you know three to six days to go from the Earth to the Moon, but th there might be different trajectories that takes a little bit longer than that. You want to make sure that's working. So we're testing that new design, uh, and it, it will be an improvement for anything they have experienced in the past. This is what it looks like on the cockpit part of the Orion crew module. It's a glass cockpit. They have three main displays to operate all the systems. And there's about 60 actual physical switches. And we put those there, not because everything can be just glass cockpit like you would see in a you know, new type of uh, interface environment. But because you're going to be in the cislunar space outside of the Van Allen radiation belts, you need to make sure that you can do some of the key functions, even if your displays were not working for any reason. So you compare the 60 switches to, for example, 566 we had in the Apollo capsule. If you go to a, in a normal airplane like a 737, still hundreds of switches. The Orion spacecraft is mostly autonomous. It has many sensors, uh, about 1,200 sensors or so. So the crew is now going to have to do a lot of the active management. As a matter of fact, Artemis 1, like I said, is going to be fully autonomous. It, you know, the spacecraft will fly by itself. We'll provide, we can command it and control it from the mission control center, but it can do it by itself. It even has cameras. If for any reason there was a full computer reset, it can find itself in space, redirect itself, and do the burns that it needs to come back home. But uh, we need the crew to be able to control it. The human element is always important. It's one, one time and again, it's proven to be a key factor to succeed in a mission when different things go wrong. So the crew will control the spacecraft from, from that cockpit. They have a lot of, we've put a lot of time in situational awareness and what type of data they need to receive because when we have a fully autonomous system, uh, it's also a little bit more complex to actually show them what the different things are that they need to comprehend and be ready to act. Moving on, we have the parachute systems. So when the spacecraft is coming in at 25,000 miles an hour, you got to really slow it down. Of course, we do that with re-entering the atmosphere. That takes it down to about 320 something uh, miles an hour. You can still land at that. So we'll deploy a series of parachutes like you saw in the video to first stabilize the, cap the capsule and you know, perform the first reduction of speed. And then the three main parachutes will come out and they're pulled by other parachutes themselves. And that will slow the capsule about 20 miles an hour. And that is the speed that they'll use to enter and you splash down on the water. And we're planning to, the splash down, the nominal splash down zone is off the coast of San Diego. That's where we'll recover the capsule when they come back. This shows the kind of stacked Orion spacecraft without the launch abort system, and that's the service module underneath. Uh, and it provides, again, tanks for propellant. It has the four solar arrays, and I'm going to show you a quick picture of that. And that really is what enables us to go to deep space. Uh, that's the propellant that we'll use for propulsion to enter in the moon, in the moon uh, orbit that we want to go to and leave from there. And then it will separate right before we re-enter the atmosphere. And like I said, this has been built in Europe. There's 10 European countries that are participating in this project. The main contractor for ESA is Airbus out of Bremen, but they have sites all over Europe. And it's been a treat to work with everybody, get different perspectives, and, and uh, get to see everybody's strengths. This is another picture of the service module underneath. It has several engines. It has a main engine and then eight auxiliary engines. Those are the red ones you can see on the side of the, myself there and another person. So they back each other up. And then they have 24 RCS thrusters, which is two strings of redundant RCS to maneuver the spacecraft in different positions and such. Those are the solar arrays. And there's four of those. They're folded up in three panels, like you saw in the previous picture. 
And uh, that, that is what's going to enable us to do longer missions. Apollo had fuel cells, so very limited supply. Oxygen and hydrogen, same thing as the space shuttle. There was a clock as soon as you launch, there's a clock on when you have to come back. And we're going to break that a little bit with the solar arrays. So back to the moon and why we're going. So um, we're trying to, you know, when we did Apollo, the, the priority was to get a man on the moon, to take that step. The priority now is to be staging ground for doing further exploration to Mars and beyond. So we're building not just uh, the fact that we'll have Orion taking the crew there, a landing system to put them on the surface of the moon, but we're also working on rovers and other robots to uh, build, basically develop an infrastructure such that we can operate long time in the moon and basically learn the know-how of what it takes to be independent from Earth so we can then take the next step. If you go to low Earth orbit, you can back to Earth and take something up there in you know, a day, hours. When you go to the moon, you're talking about a week, six, three to six days to get something there. When you go to Mars, you're talking about a year. So you gotta prove all of that before you can take that step. We're gonna be building the gateway system, uh, which is kind of a space station around the moon. Uh, it's gonna allow us to keep humans there so we can study what it is, that, what they experience when they're working in deep space outside of the Van Allen radiation belts. We've learned a lot in low Earth orbit, but that is the next step. And it's also going to allow us to basically uh, dock Orion and the human landing system so we can go to different points of the moon wherever the, the science takes us. Uh, the gateway is also built through international cooperation, and we're going to use the SLS and Orion to be the backbone to build that, just like we use the space shuttle to build the International Space Station. And then we're partnering with commercial partners to potentially do the logistics to the gateway and also the human landing system. So we're putting a lot of effort in fomenting that commercial uh, entrepreneurship that we're already seeing is paying huge dividends, not only for them, but for us and everybody with the science that we're getting. So just to close, I wanna take you back to the picture uh, and kind of reflect on why we're doing these things. Uh, going back to the moon is not about doing something we've done before. It's about getting the know-how, developing the technology that's gonna allow us to go farther. We're gonna, you know, there's resources on the moon that may be very valuable to, you know, stage things to go to not just Mars, but other planets. We know that there's water there. Uh, maybe the commercial companies will learn a way on how to make money out of it. So there is a scientific reason, the monetary reason, and then one of the most important things that I don't think we talk about eno enough is inspiring other people, inspiring the future wave of explorers, people that are gonna be entrepreneurs, even if it's not space, but you know, allowing people to see that what seems impossible is not impossible, that we can do it. I feel like it's my duty to uh, work on pushing the envelope, and I do that through my work in Orion and the Artemis program, but it really is to, to enable the vision that we have to eventually go to Mars is gonna take if several generations to get there. So by going back to the moon after 49 years, uh, potentially building the systems and stepping for the first time on Mars, we think that's gonna be a tsunami of inspiration for young people and multiple generations. I wasn't alive when the Apollo program happened, but I was inspired by it, by reading about it, watching videos, seeing pictures, and kind of hearing the stories of what it took to go there. So we, wanna, we need to continue that. We need to do the same. You saw uh, folks here that are 15, 16 year olds doing amazing things. We gotta keep that far going and we gotta basically find the ones that haven't maybe found that inspiration yet. And we're gonna do that by doing amazing things. Going back to the moon and going to Mars is the next step. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope you've enjoyed it. And I give you a little bit of insight of what we're doing.